it is an honor to be here. Thank you for calling me. I don't feel I deserve giving an Orbit Wiener lecture. There will be a lot of computing and some ideas that are maybe interesting, but not enough math, maybe, in what I will tell you. I do remember as a kid buying in Greek the Kivernitiki book that, that in, in, in Greek translation. And since I'm speaking here, uh, let me tell you a few things that, that uh, come to my mind when I come to visit this department. First, there is a I, 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 when I went to grad school, it was very, very early 80s, Soviets still existed, and nonlinear dynamics was the big thing at the time, and so Maryland always makes me think of York and Ott, and there is a lot of people that, and a lot of what I will tell you will have to do with dynamics, because that's what's close to my heart. There is a lot of uh, friends here. You may not know that uh, your own Manos Grilakis was an undergrad chemical engineer. We were in the same undergraduate class before he became a mathematician. And then they, you know, there is friends like Dave Levermore and Nathan Tadman, whatever. But since I'm here, let me also kind of use this opportunity to rem remember one of your own, Dennis Healy, who was a guy, a wonderful guy that, that, that uh, touched my life and my research in many ways. I, he could see much better than me what I was doing, and uh, he left us very early. Um, this is, uh, OK, obviously, this is a ridiculous title. I must mean something. I hope by the end I will explain what I mean. Uh, what I want to talk about is the computational study of complex systems. This is the twist in the last couple of years. Uh, if you want no equations, is something we started doing 20 years ago, no variables 10 years ago, and this is the more recent stuff I will explain. There are some mathematicians in the mix, like Rafi Koifman, and numerical analysts like Bill, Bill Gear, but then there is the people that actually do the work, the postdocs and the students. Let me say that uh, there is also some undergraduates that, that, that have done some of the things I will show you. Um, this is something that we started doing a very long time ago. Tony Roberts is a mathematician. He is in Australia. He is a friend in 2001 wrote a little paper in which what he did is that he took a model of plankton. So this is an agent-based model where there are 20,000 little dots. Each one of these things is supposed to be an organism, so this should resonate with Ethan. And then each one of these guys, they, they are steered by the ocean. They give birth. They die. They do a random walk. And you can have a simulation at the microscopic level. And then this is an, uh, an observer. So the, the important thing here is just to show you this movie. This movie is two different views of the same thing. On the one side, you see what the organisms are doing. On the other side, you see a, a closed equation for the right macroscopic observable, which here happens to be the pair correlation function. And the point is that this is a horrible mess. While if you look at the evolution of the pair correlation function, then what you find is that you see, you could say this looks like a partial differential equation that goes to a steady state with a, a little oscillation. So the important thing in this is uh, to, to a modeler, a lot of everything I'm going to tell you has to do with modeling such problems. The important thing with this is that if you have a problem, if you have a realization of the problem, if you observe the problem in this format, then it looks very much like show and tell. You run it, and then you show the movies to your friends, and you say, look, there are striations, it is mixing, whatever. But then if you are smart enough, or you have smart enough friends to be able to derive an effective partial differential equation for the right observable, then you don't have to worry about this. You can work with this. And the thing that personally was always very, very interesting to me is that in this version of a problem, you can basically only do forward simulation. This is a stochastic large system of interacting particles, while here, of course, you can do simulation of the partial differential equation, but you can also do steady state calculations, fixed point calculations, eigen calculations. So the point is that this is a realization of the problem in which only some computational tools apply, while this is a different formulation of the same problem in which many, many more tools apply from the ones that we know and love, especially computationally. And so this is something that we did with Bill Gear first time in 2001. This is integrating the evolution equation for the pair correlation function without being able to write it down. So what does this mean? 
Uh, it is very important that to do this, somebody must first tell you what is the right macroscopic observable, the quantity in terms of which you would be able to write a closed macroscopic equation. So in this case, let's say that Tony Roberts tells us it would be the pair correlation function. Uh, let's say that you want to integrate this equation. How do you integrate the partial differential equation? You discretize it, and then at the given initial condition, the right-hand side of the equation gives you a time derivative, and if you do the integration very simply with an Euler step, then you use the time derivative to take a step. You do Taylor series, and then you have a new initial condition. For the new initial condition, you estimate the time derivative, you get the time derivative from the equation, you make another step. But here, if we have an initial condition in the macro variables, in the pair correlation function, we don't really have a right-hand side that will tell us the time derivative. So what do we do? We take the macro initial condition, we create particle initializations that have this macro initial condition, that is, that are consistent with this macro initial condition. We run the particles for a short time. This is the magic. You run the particles for a short time. How short? Long enough for the, all the higher order moments of the distribution that you don't carefully initialize to get slaved to the macro important quantity, and then after this brief burst of computational experiment with the particles, you estimate the time derivative of the macro quantity. So what is the idea? The idea is that instead of having a right-hand side of an equation that will tell you the time derivative, you do a brief burst or several brief bursts of simulation with the agent-based code, and then you use this computational experiment to estimate what the right-hand side of the equation would give you if you were smart enough to have it. So you see, it is a little bit funny. It's not that you don't have equations. You have equations at this level. It's at this level that you don't have equations. It's not that this is completely trivial, because you have to know for how long you run, how many copies to do variance reduction, how to do a good estimate, and so on and so forth. What do you benefit? You benefit that by using this Euler step, this coarse-grained Euler step at the macro level. If you want, you save the ratio of the time scales between the jiggling particles, if you want, and the macro, slow, ponderously evolving pair correlation function. So the idea is that you do the closure on the fly. You use the microcode. If you want, you carry the microcode in your pocket. Every time you need something from the equation, you just do design little bursts of computational experiments that give you these numbers. You don't get them from formulas. Your inner products, your action of Jacobians, you don't get them from formulas. You get them from brief bursts of computational experiments. This is something that has been going on for a long time, and you can do nice numerical analysis for it. There is a lot of good work that has been done on such closure on the fly problems, if you want. The main, pro main point is that if you have a detailed simulator, bless you, or an experiment, and this is, the, this is the, 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 the key or the beginning of today's lecture, if somebody tells you what are the right macro variables, then you can use the idea that a macro equation exists to accelerate the simulation, or in general, the way by which you can extract information from the microscopic code. So it's equation-free in the sense that there is no explicit equation closed form equation at the macro level, there is equations at the micro level, but the, in order to be able to work without equations, the first thing is that somebody has to tell you, you should look at the pair correlation function. If you look at chemistry, you should look at concentrations and temperatures. If you look at uh, mecha fluid mechanics, you should look at uh, densities and energies and momenta. Uh, the important thing is, how do we know what the right macro observables are? In most of the problems that come with our standard education, we know that what are good variables for chemistry, what are good variables for, for mechanics, what are good variables for non-Newtonian fluid mechanics. The idea is that these days we work with a lot of new problems where we do not know. We work with problems that are new enough, like agent-based models, in which we don't know what the right macro variables are in terms of which we would write equations. And the idea is that we are going to use data mining or manifold learning techniques. My particular poison, since I work with Rafi Koifman, is, is diffusion maps, but it doesn't have to be diffusion maps, in order to be able to not only have no equations, but to not need to also know what the right macro variables are, get the macro variables also from the simulation itself. Where do good 
macro variables come from. Sometimes we know that if, you know, we can use enough Fourier modes, we're going to get a good enough approximation of a function, or enough moments, we're going to have a good enough approximation of a distribution. Sometimes it comes from a lot of experience. Some people are, we know that somebody is particularly skilled at being able to, for example, all of us put our money in, 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 in some fund our, our retirement money, we believe that there exists a person that has a good idea in their head of which way the market will go, better than we. So, so or some other times you have, uh, I don't know, you have, you have Landau, and Landau knows what is the right phase field variable for a particular problem. So it could be, uh, it, it could be experience, it could be brilliance, it could be that somebody understands why they choose these observables, or it could be that they have observables in their head, but they don't really know why they choose them. Uh, anyway, the point is that it, it can come from either knowing a lot about the problem or working a lot on a problem. And then what I'm kind of preaching these days is something rather medieval, but interesting, which is uh, instead of having the lot of experience or the lot of work or brilliance or finding brilliant friends that have the brilliance is to try and use machine learning in order to get the right variables in terms of which we're going to make dynamic models. Um, for 130 or so years, I think, one uh, got good reduced variables by doing principal component analysis, singular value decomposition. You have very high dimensional data, three dimensional. They live on a lower dimensional hyperplane. If we do singular value decomposition, then we can describe every point not with three numbers, but with two numbers. And around 2000, there is these uh, little mini explosion, if you want. There is two back-to-back -back papers in, in science. Uh, one is about local linear embedding, and one is about isomap. And the idea is that now we can formulate a problem so that not only can we find hyperplanes, but we can also find and parametrize low-dimensional manifolds, so curved surfaces. And uh, so the idea is that we have simulation data from a problem. We do something like this. And not only do we get the param we, we we are able to find the dimensionality, if you want, of this manifold, but also get a parametrization of this manifold. And the point of the story is that the variables that can be used to parametrize the manifold, those would be good observables in terms of which to write evolution equations on the manifold. So the idea, again, it's a very simple thing. I'm sorry for kind of saying it again. Not only do you use manifold learning techniques in order to get a parametrization of the results of your simulation, but having the parametrization, you can use the equation-free ideas to develop dynamical models for what happens. And so this is my first example. This comes from a paper that was published last summer with Or Yair and Ronen Talmon and Rafi Koefman. And uh, I told you that I'm a dynamical systems person at heart. So this is a Takens Bogdan of singularity. This is just a little example. This is what happens when, when, you, when two things go wrong at the same time. Like you, you drive, and then you hit a pothole, and then at the same time, the, the radiator explodes. So if you have two eigenvalues zero uh, uh, and nothing else wrong, then uh, this is an unfolding. The, of, this is the normal form. So this is a. Please look, it's a nonlinear dynamical system. It has two variables, two parameters. All the problems in the world that have two things go wrong at the same time and nothing worse can be in the neighborhood of that parameter value be mapped to this. These are all the possible physical face portraits that you can find. And the idea, again, this is at the heart of normal form theory in nonlinear dynamics. The idea is that, that, that you know the normal forms, and then you find what are the non-degeneracy conditions and the defining conditions, and then you know what will qualitatively happen in your neighborhood. No matter if it's fluid mechanics, if it is uh, chemical kinetics, if it is a car that is hitting a pothole. Uh, but this is just my little example. I just wanted to show you what this looks like. And in what I'm going to tell you about now, I am really having a dynamical system that has some observables x, some state variables x, some parameters p, some evolution equation f, and some observation function g. And I really know nothing about them. I only know that I've done some experiments. So I just randomly choose conditions at which I will let the system run. And the system is a black box. And for each one of these conditions, uh, Rafi 
Koifman calls them trials. For every trial, you measure a whole bunch of outputs coming out of the problem. You're not exactly sure what it is that you're measuring, but you're measuring a whole bunch of very rich outputs. How to think of this? Think of this as having a whole bunch of different initial conditions. You don't exactly know what initial conditions you're, you're observing, but you set the parameter values, so you set the trial conditions, and then you measure a whole bunch of time series coming out of the box. Uh, this is Kalman, who is, so we are really talking about doing nonlinear system identification. Kalman, who died uh, a couple of years ago, and, 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 and then in very early 91, uh, uh, this is my, my, my view, a little miracle happened. There is this guy, he can tell it's 1981 because of the hair. So this, this, this guy is an electrical engineer, and he, uh, he, he writes a rather magical paper that says, uh, if I have a linear problem, uh, give me lots of input data and lots of output data. And what I'm going to do is that I am going to give you uh, what is called a balanced, re a minimal balanced realization. That is, I'm going to create a linear problem that is a realization of yours. It'll be minimal. It'll have the smallest number of variables. It'll be, the word is balanced. It has something to do with robustness. It has to do with aligning observability and controllability subspaces. I'm going to give you, allow me to not correctly say robust. I'm going to give you a minimal robust realization of your system, a system that is given these inputs gives you these outputs. So this was done for linear problems in 1981, and I am showing you something that was done last year. So let's say that this is the parameter space. I don't really know what the parameters are or what their magnitudes are. This is a blind monkey. The blind monkey turns a knob, and you see this is more of a computer science talk. So the blind, forgive me, the computer scientist, please, I, I apologize. Okay, an engineering talk, if you want. So the, the, the monkey turns the knobs, and then a dart gets thrown somewhere in parameter space, let's say at the blue conditions. And then at the blue conditions, you get 500 measurements out of the system, 500 channels. Uh, think of these channels as a whole bunch of different initial conditions. So you get short transients from any different initial conditions. You have no idea what the initial conditions are. You just get measurements that come out of the box. And then the monkey throws other darts in parameter space. And for the red conditions, you get red measurements. And for the green conditions, you get green measurements. And so in the end, what you end up having is, let's say, 100 different trials. And for each one of these trials, you get 500 measurements, 500 channels, but you don't know what the conditions are and you don't know what you're measuring. You just have labels that tells you that these 500 measurements were obtained at the same trial, trial number 35. And those 500 measurements were obtained at the same trial, trial number 49. So 100 times 500, you have 50,000 hairs. And these 50,000 hairs, the blues, the only thing you know is that the blue hairs were obtained, ob observed together and the red hairs were observed together, and you don't even really know that they're red or blue. You just have labels. You know, these are the, the, the hairs that were observed in experiment number 19, and those are the hairs that were observed in experiment number 29. And so now what you do uh, is a little manifold learning. You take all the hairs, independent of what experiment they come from, for the problems that I'm going to show you, the hairs are two-dimensional time series, two variables as a function of time for 10 seconds. So you take these hairs, and what you do is that you do, you may want to think principal components, or you may want to think diffusion maps. What you do is that you, we, we, we try and create a geometry on which these hairs live, independent of what experiment they come from. So I try to think of a of, of, of a politically not too incorrect analogy for this. So let, let's say that, uh, that the experiments are cities in Europe, and uh, you get 500 people from Stockholm, and 500 people from Zurich, and 500 people from Athens. And uh, let's say that uh, the people in Stockholm, you might expect they're taller and blonder. And you may expect that the people in Athens are maybe shorter and have curlier hair. So you, first, you don't think of where everybody comes from. You just create a geometry for all the people, independent of what city they come from. And then you color them by what city they come from. And you get something that looks horrible because, let's say that the blue ones are tall, blonde people. So there is tall, blonde people in Stockholm. 
There is also tall blonde people in Athens, but they are much fewer in Athens than in Stockholm. And at the first iteration, we have just looked at whether people are tall and blonde, and we did not look at all about where they come from. Having constructed this geometry then, what we do is that we take all the people from Stockholm. You see, there is many tall blondes and a few shorter, darker hairs. And all the people in Athens, many shorter, darker, curly hairs, but also a few tall blondes. And then what we do is that we do an earth mover distance between the ensemble of the Stockholm people and the ensemble of the Athens people. And having done this, we now have an idea of how far experiment 19 is from experiment 25. So next time we're going to do this iteration, what we're going to do is that we're going to take the hairs, and every time that we're going to compare a hair with another hair, a measurement with another measurement, we will not only look how far they look from each other as time series, but we will have an extra entry that will say, yes, you are tall blonde, but you come from experiment 19 that had many tall blondes. And yes, you are tall blonde, but you come from experiment 25 that had very few. And so, if you want, we are creating now a more informed metric or a more informed geometry so that first we work only with the hairs, then we use this in order to get a sense of the geometry of the trials, then we take this information and we pass it to the hairs, iterate again on the hairs, iterate again on the trials, iterate again on the hairs, iterate again on the trials. Sometimes somebody will prove conditions under which this converges, I can only tell you, I told you I will show you mainly numerical experiments, that by doing a few iterations in this three, if I remember correctly in this, you in a sense find the color of the hairs. That is, you can find out what is the right way to organize the trials in their parameter space. And in effect, even though you just had random labels on parameter space, you can reorganize the parameter space, you can reconstruct it, and the only thing that you're really using is smoothness, similarity between the measurements. So for the particular problem of the Tykens Bogdanov, we take the face portrait, we take a bunch of short time series, we scramble them, we do this for 400 different parameter values that are scrambled, and so we have I don't even remember now how many hundred trials with how many hundred hairs. We throw them all together in the sack, we shake them, and then we do what I told you. And then one day, Ronan Talmon calls from the Technion and says, this was the parameter space that we started with. These are all the trial parameter values. We took these, we scrambled them, we gave them random labels. For each one of them, we got 500 time series. We scrambled those, we gave them random measurements, we do our data mining that is basically based on diffusion maps. And then what you get is that the thing comes back and tells you, you did have 400 trials. This is how you should order them. They really are a two-dimensional family of trials. And this is who is the neighbor of whom. And um, if you take these guys and you kind of peel off the little white paper that says number 19, then you find that all the guys that have limit cycles are organized correctly together. All the guys that have two state, you know, that have one steady state are organized well together. And uh, at least, you know, visually you would say this is certainly homeomorphic, maybe even isometric to, to, to what would happen over here. So what this does is that it takes the measurements and it creates a parameter space. Not only that, but what it does is that it also creates a phase space. Remember there were, there were I don't know, 500 time series. It takes these 500 time series that were given random labels and it organizes them. It tells them, you know, you really have two state variables and this is how you should organize your state space. So it creates a realization of the state space. It already created the realization of the parameter space. And I hope you can see that uh, this is the phase space that comes from data mining, and it is colored by the original X and the original Y, so that you see that what one has constructed or what one has found is a rotation and slight deformation of what the original measurements were obtained in. And so we have a realization of the parameter space, we have a realization of the state space, and now if you take a hair out of the sack, you know what are the realization of its parameter values, you know what is the realization of the state variables, and you have a time derivative. So in effect, you have a tabulated equation, and you can integrate the tabulated equation. So as long as you don't go very far away from the place in parameter space and state space where you had gotten data, 
then you have created the realization of the problem. Um, so Ronen, who actually did the calculation, wanted to also include this. This is maybe to make a point. Um, this is two pendula, and they are connected to each other with a spring. And if in the end of the evening you went home and said somebody gave a talk today, and in this talk they talked about, they showed the movie in which there were two pendula that were oscillating, and they were connected with each other. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if, if as time goes on, the spring becomes stiffer and stiffer, <coughs> then, as you might expect, the oscillations are going to become faster and faster. But this is something that you can describe. Uh, what Ronen did is that he take, took this movie and then uh, broke this movie into a 10 by 10 set of pixels. And then he took the average intensity of the color in each one of these pixels. And then he multiplied them by a set of random numbers. And so what was something that made mental sense in terms of oscillators and pendula that are talking to each other and oscillating now became something that is much messier and that is not very easy to describe. Uh, the only thing that I can tell you is that you can see that the oscillations become faster and faster. And so that's the best thing that I can tell you to convince you that what you see here is just an alternative, invertible view of the previous movie. The point is, this is something that is not easy to humanly summarize. But uh, if one looks at, let's say, the frequency content of either the pendulum movie or the movie that has the that has these kind of oscillatory pixels, then you will find equally well the constant frequency and the frequency that is changing gradually. So the point is, again, that even though I cannot explain in an easily humanly understandable way what the movie is, uh, one can find the important features of the problem. If you want, one can be predictive about what will happen in the problem, even though the variables don't make very much physical sense. And uh, so you could say this is a little bit like, uh, um, like looking in crystal balls. Uh, you have a query. There is the crystal ball that has all the data. And then you get a prediction. And the prediction could be quite good. But you don't know what, what the prediction, how the prediction was really obtained. This is something that I was not involved with. It comes from Rafi. Um, Koifman, so this comes from looking at a psychological questionnaire, the Minnesota something something questionnaire. Uh, there is, if I remember correctly, 3,000 people and 350 statements. And what you do, so think every person is like a trial. And the 350 things are 350 channels. And what you do is that you give these people the statements, and they read them, and then they say yes or no. And that gives you a dot or does not give you a dot. I don't remember who is the yes or the no, the white or the black. And so you can think of this as exactly the kind of problem that I was telling you up to now. There is a whole bunch of experiments. And for each experiment, there is 350 measurement channels. And then you do in this exactly the same thing that I was telling you for the hairs. And what comes out is that the people, so this is the people are the trial. So this is the parameter space. The parameter space appears to be very well organized as a two-dimensional manifold. And the red people are the people that the psychologists, the domain experts, say are normal, quote unquote. And the light blue people are the people that the psychologists say are not normal, whatever that means. And uh, this is also scary, because all of this is done without knowing who the people are or what they answered yes or no to. This is, that was the parameter space. So it looked like a two-dimensional parameter space. You understand, this is a bi-clustering problem or a Netflix problem. You're, you have people and movies, and they tell you what they like and they don't like. And then you can create a bi-clustering of both the people and the movies. So you can have classifications of people and classifications of movies. Here is, this does not look so clearly two-dimensional. You can think of it a little bit as the surface of a balloon. The red questions are the questions that the normal people answer yes, and the non-normal people answer no. The blue, light blue questions are the questions where the non-normal people answer yes, and the normal people answer no. It's really interesting when you peel off the little paper that has the number for these light blue questions, 
See, 408, I'm apt to take disappointment so keenly I can't put them out of my mind. I'm often sorry because I'm so irritable and grouchy. I hate going to doctors even when I'm sick. I forget where I leave things. So uh, the, again, the thing that is scary in this is that uh, this classification can be done without knowing anything about the people and anything about the nature of the questions, but by lo just looking at, at the by clustering of the response patterns. So uh, this little vignette, so there's two vignettes in what I'm telling you. This one was about no equations, no variables, and no parameters. Okay? And now, and this is a collaboration with a couple, started with a couple of people in, in Germany, I want to tell you a little bit about the no space and no time. Um, so in, in 1979, was it 79? Good. Uh, when was it that, that the embassy in Tehran was abandoned to the, to, to the Iranians? 79. So in 1979, we Americans, I also am American now, uh, 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 left the embassy in Tehran. I don't know how many of you saw Argo. And, and, and what, uh, they, they, they did not expect that they would have to leave the embassy. And then in the end, they didn't have enough time to burn the secret documents. So they shredded them. And what the Iranians did is that they took a number of people that Wikipedia says were good were skilled carpet weavers, and they put them in a room, and they said, you don't get out of the room unless you can kind of put the shreds together again. And indeed, the people, I don't know how long it took, but they did put the documents back together again. And uh, actually also, in 2001, I think, DARPA, no, 2010 or 11, DARPA had a shredding contest. What they did is that they took five different documents. One of them was a handwritten memo, one was a printed, one was a sketch, and they shredded them in different ways by hand, by putting them through a shredder. They put the pieces on the web and said, whoever puts them back together again gets $50,000. And within a couple of weeks, there was a company in San Francisco that got the $50,000. And it is surprising because it is kind of easy. Uh, remember, again, I told you I'm more of a dynamical systems person. So look, this is exactly the same problem, but now this is a partial differential equation in space and time. This is a Ginsburg-Landau in some parameter settings. And then what you see is literally the output of a printer, spatio-temporal behavior over some time. And what you do is that you take exactly this piece of paper as it comes out of the printer, and then you pass it through a shredder, and you're, you're ending up with a few hundred time series. And so you take these time series and mix them, and uh, you get this. And so two time series that were very close to each other in space go very far from each other now in space. And the main point of the exercise is that if you think of each one of these time series as a data point, and then you do diffusion maps on these data points, or again, your other favorite manifold learning tool, then what you find is that you can find a good parametrization of all of these guys. And it actually turns out that for this problem, the leading diffusion map eigenvector happens to be one to one with physical space. So if you take these, five, these 512 time series and you look at their component in the first principal component and you just sort the values numerically, then what you do is that you get space back. And uh, when you do this, uh, you see also you don't actually get space. You get the flip of space because minus an eigenvector is also an eigenvector. So this is not that picture, but it is that picture flipped. So what this tells you is that if I have time series measurements on an attractor, but I do not know where they are in space, I can still use smoothness and similarity and machine learning in order to reconstruct space from the measurements, even though I don't know what space is. Actually, to be more careful, this is the same picture. I am now becoming more and more medieval. First, I tore a page. Now I'm tearing a book. This is a two-dimensional problem in space, and this is the time direction. What we do is that we take this and we push it through a meat grinding machine so that we get 200 by 200 time series. We mix all of these time series. 
We don't know if they come from a 1D problem, a 2D problem, a 3D problem. We do diffusion maps. And what we do, what we find is that it comes back and tells us that your 40,000 or 400,000 or 4 million time series, they actually are a two-parameter family of time series. This is how they should be organized. And if you actually look at this, now it is very clear you don't reconstruct a space. You reconstruct something that is one-to-one -one with the original space. It is slightly deformed. And if you look at it again, you, if you look at it carefully, you will also see that it happens to be flipped. So the idea, again, is that you, if we have data and we do not know how to organize them in space, we've, th this is a funny statement. If, if we lost the x and y of where the measurements were taken, then we can get them back. Uh, here is a place that I would hope would interest some of you, a place in which we actually do not have a physical space. So this is a network. This is a network of 512 neurons. It has something to do with an NIH grant that has something to do with the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That is not so much the point. Just think of it as a large set of 512 differential sets of differential equations. Each set is 16 differential equations, and they are all coupled to each other in some weird way. It's not all to all. It's not small world. This is just a messy network. And they just happen to all of them be synchronized. And you look at them. You look at the 512 different trajectories. And you do data mining on these 512 different trajectories. and your code comes back and tells you, you know what? These 512 different trajectories, they really are a two-parameter family of trajectories. So what does this really tell you? These are very heterogeneous neurons. They are heterogeneous because their kinetics are different, because their connectivity in the network is different, whatever. But at this level of resolution, it turns out that these 512 neurons could be thought of as a discretization of a two-dimensional problem in space. That is, there are features, two features of the neurons, phi 1 and phi 2, that come out of data mining. And if two neurons have phi 1 and phi 2 that are close to each other, their entire time-dependent behavior is close to each other. So in effect, this gives you a good embedding space for the network. It's not a physical space, but for all practical purposes, you could use this space. Uh, consider this. This is very interesting. If the problem can be described in terms of two variables, whether you have 512 points or 50,000 points or 500,000 points, as long as you have a good enough discretization, you're going to get the same behavior. So in effect, what I am telling you is that one can use such tools in order to figure out if there exists an interesting space in which to embed the network in such a way that then one can make a reduced model of it. There is an extra little twist. After the network, af after one gets the simulations, and after, one's, after one uh, finds this classification, if you want, or this organization of the data, we go in and color the data by, first, one of the kinetic heterogeneous constants that have to do with the physiology of the neurons. And it turns out that this kinetic constant that is heterogeneous along the neurons is very roughly one to one with one of the observed space variables. And then we color by the degree, the connectivity degree of the neuron in the network. And that happens to be one to one with the other direction. What is this supposed to say? Uh, this is supposed to say that after you find how many are the important nonlinear features of the properties of the networks that are good for describing the behavior, you can go in and test the hypothesis. Are these three things one-to-one -one with these three physical things or with those three physical things? That is, you can go in a post-mortem, if you want that analysis, and try and figure out which of the features of the problem that make physical sense are one-to-one -one with the features of the problem that give you a good description. Um, in what I told you, I had the simulation from the PDE, and I shredded in space. And I used time series in order to reconstruct the space. You can turn the page on its side and shred it this way. That is, you can take time snapshots and then scramble them, do exactly the same business, and reconstruct the movie. That is, you can reconstruct 
space if you have lost the space labels. You can reconstruct time if you have lost the time labels. And actually, you don't. there's no reason to do it one way or the other way or sideways. One can take some sort of cookie cutter and take little patches of space time. And then one can do data mining on these patches on space time. And from these patches of space time, it is possible to kind of put together back the space time movie. So the idea, yes? Yes, it's exactly, yeah, and it's very good. <laughs> this is exactly what this is. This, and, and you already know that there exist papers that one can find about finding jigsaw puzzles, the, about solving jigsaw puzzles. The thing that is interesting is, and, and, and of course we do it mentally all the time, but since you said it, this is a very, inter, a very easy jigsaw puzzle because uh, really, if you want to look at smoothness, you really only have to do at the edges of each one of these and match all possible edges and find where it is, fits best. Ah, but what would happen if these guys were not beautifully tiling the plane, but they were overlapping, they were partially, they didn't have perfect edges and so on and so forth. So it can become more and more messy how you would take many different slices of something like that and pull them together. This one is the easy one, exactly as you said. Uh, this is for fun because I had German collaborators in this. So this is Germany. And what I am showing you is uh, seven cities in Germany. And this is a shredding of the geography of Germany. What you do is that you go to each one of these cities on a given day, which I think was October, and then you create a set of Boolean vectors. Every five minutes you say, is the sun above the horizon or is it below the horizon? And you get these guys. And then what you do is that you do diffusion maps or even principal components, and then what you get is Germany back. It's very easy to see, if you do it, that there exists a, there exists, there exists a two-dimensional variability in these time series. There are two principal components that can be used to describe them well. And then what you get is something that is a slight deformation of true Germany. The thing that is more interesting, and that is the thing that I kind of want to conclude with, is that this is a completely different way of measuring exactly the same thing. Instead of going on one day and getting time series in the one day, what you do is that you, for the entire year, for each one of these cities, you just only keep two numbers, sun up and sun down. You can see that this is a measurement of the same thing, but in a different way. It is possible to analyze the data in such a way so that you get the same realization, phi 1, phi 2, of the geography of Germany. Here, it is not exactly the same. They are still one to one with each other. But again, and this is what I will conclude with, and that's why I said gauge invariance. I don't mean gauge invariance in the particular sense of uh, uh, electromagnetism. I mean being able to do data mining in a way, if you have rich enough data, in a way that is invariant to the measuring instrument. Whether you are measuring the same phenomenon by looking at what happens on one day or by looking at what happens through the year, you can get the same realization for the problem. You can understand that this dynamical system and that dynamical system are realizations of the same thing. You can, if you want, start thinking, is it possible to use machine learning to realize that the diffusion equation is another way to look at the viscous burgers? Can you get Kohlhopf not by brilliance or inspiration, but from data mining? And so let me, I, I, I see that I have like, how am I doing? I have seven minutes or something like that? Okay. What, two minutes. Two, two plus five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I started 15 past. So anyway, uh, uh, let me just, so I, what I will do is that I will show you uh, uh, three computational experiments. But in, I already have told you that uh, my ambition or my program or my, the thing that interests me these days is to take these tools that we have been, and many people have been developing, and instead of applying them to problems for which we do not have equations and have only data, to actually apply them to problems in which we do have equations, because it is not inconceivable that that way we're going to find much simpler representations of what we are doing. Or maybe we're going to find that different models are really just transformations of each other in the spirit of the diffusion equation and the Burgers equation, the, the, the viscous Burgers being related with Kohlhopf. 
Uh, so what I will show you, and again, it's, I appreciate it's a little bit of an advertisement, is that uh, this happens to be, this is the kuramoto sivashinsky PDE in one equation, in one space dimension with periodic boundary conditions. This happens to be a modulated traveling wave. Let me just say that whether my measurements are at fixed locations in space and looking in time, whether they are fixed locations in time looking in space, whether there are patches overlapping or not overlapping, or whether they're even active particles. So I have observers that are moving around. As long as I can do my data mining in the right way, then I can figure out that it is the same attractor. And then uh, this is something that uh, uh, I personally like very much. This and one more and I will stop. Uh, this is a two-dimensional Ginzburg-Landau. This is two dimensions in space, x and y, and this happens to be, don't look at that part, look only on this part. This happens to be uh, uh, one of these, you would call them spatio-temporally chaotic regimes. You see there is regimes that are kind of laminar and there is places that are messy. And you, this, this is one of the fields. The PDE has several fields, this is one of them. And I want you to see that down here there are some funny colors. The colors come from data mining. The colors are such that if a they come from looking at short time series of evaluated at that point. If things have the same color, then they are more or less around the same location on the overall attractor of the partial differential equation. And so I am playing it again. You can think of this as cities. And then the red are the people that go to work, the blue are the people that go to eat, the yellow are the people that are kind of taking it easy. And now this is the representation of the dynamics in physical space. This is the representation of the same dynamics but in activity space. And what you see above here is the PDF of how many people are eating, how many people are working, how many people are taking it easy. And if you look at it in this format, then you will kind of agree with me, this is just tempting, and I don't have anything more to show you than the movie, that this looks a much more organized and almost periodic or slightly quasi-periodic behavior. So again, the important thing is to be able to go back and forth between different representations of the problem. As a matter of fact, this is something that I also very much like. If you are sitting on a compact attractor, then you can go forward in time or backward in time forever, what you see here is one of these one-dimensional Ginzburg-Landau's. This is activity as it plays in space. This is the space of activities and this black curve, this snake as we call it, this is where physical space happens to be at that moment. So in the movie that I will show you, here you will see if you sit at some place in space, what activity occurs as a function of time. While here, if you sit on one activity, you will see where in space does this activity occur at that moment in time. So this is characteristics. It is not a very beautiful movie. I kind of apologize for this. But again, I want you to get the sense that there is something that is periodic or slightly quasi-periodic here. So again, the idea would be that machine learning may provide us interesting tools for looking at the things for which we already have models but maybe more complicated models than necessary. And here is my last movie, and I will show this and stop. This is a two-dimensional, again, Ginzburg-Landau in space. This is for parameter values in which you basically get fronts. This is for parameter values where you get fronts, and then down here you get oscillations. These, these, these kinds of solutions are called chimeras, especially people that play with networks know them a lot. Uh, there is some part of the domain in space where something happens and then another part in which something different happens. And this is a regime where part of the domain is quiescent and part of the domain is spatiotemporally turbulent. This is a snapshot. What I'm going to show you and stop with and just think of it as, as, as something beautiful is uh, instead of looking at spatiotemporal mess in two dimensions, this is exactly the same movie, but it is played not in terms of what happens in space, it is played in terms of what types or activity are happening all over space. Uh, I am not really telling you what these parametrizations are. They come from machine learning, uh, from diffusion maps. I just want to very just visually tell you that A, this looks very much like swarming, and B, these are the projections of the attractor. And for those of you that play with dynamical systems, I hope you would kind of agree with me that looks very Shilnikovish. There is a 
homoclinic connection which in the one direction has a real eigenvalue and in the other has a complex conjugate. Again, my point is, and I will stop here, that um, I think that these tools are not only good for problems where there is data and no equations, but I think they're also good for problems where there are equations. Now, I am done. Um, I was in Princeton and I moved to, to Hopkins this year after 31 years. One of the good things in Princeton is that, uh, also in Hopkins, is that you have a lot of classicists around. So I don't know how many of you know Jhumpa Lahiri. She has a Pulitzer Prize. And um, uh, after many years of writing novels, she wrote a book that's called In Other Words. And uh, if you think about it, the what is the main idea? In, in, in what is gauge invariance representing the same thing in different ways? In music, you can transcribe a piece and play it with an orchestra, or you can play it with a quartet. In literature, you translate. It is the same ideas, but in different words, right? And uh, at some point, she decided to start writing in Italian. She was married to an Italian. And think of it, it is really interesting to get somebody who speaks English and he has a Pulitzer Prize in literature to decide to start writing in another language. And then she writes a book about it. And after she writes the book about it, it's a wonderful book. It's beautifully crafted in Italian and translated. I read it. It's very interesting. But at some point, it becomes, for me, I may feel it tiny, a little mon monotonous because it just talks about how difficult it is to write in a different language. It is not easy, right? All the nuances and everything. And before I put the book down, I look at the afterword, and it really amazes me. In 1939, 50 years, 15 years before he died, Henri Matisse began to move away from traditional painting and develop a new artistic technique. It involved cutting up pieces of paper that had been painted in gouache in various colors. Matisse then combined and arranged them, uh, different pieces, to create an image. He fixed the elements first with pins, then with paste, often directly on the wall. He stopped using the easel, the canvas. His main tool became a pair of scissors rather than the brush. The method, a sort of synthesis of collage and mosaic, arose out of limitations. The eyesight of the 70-year-old painter was not going well. He had an illness. He couldn't stand and work, and so on and so forth. Last paragraph, and I will let you free. The images on paper were more simplified, crude compared to the ones on canvas, but they required painstaking, complex workmanship. One recognizes the hand and the eye of the painter, but they have changed. We follow the thread between the new method and the earlier paintings and are aware of a turning point, a radical move. Matisse said the conditions for this journey are 100% different. He compares his method, which he called painting with scissors, to the experience of flying. I read this to Rafi Koifman. He says, I have a code that does that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>